Okay, so the last speaker, and last but certainly not least uh, speaker of this session is Dr. Elel Vostbloch from Tel Aviv. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I was, very, I was really delighted in a previous session to see that my co our colleagues in uh, life sciences look at processes that are rather slow, but have adapted extremely fast. In our field, we're looking at very fast processes and adaptation and science is quite slow. And I'd like to show you that maybe it requests some paradigm changes or shifts. Now, when you're monitoring an invisible subsurface rupture that progresses at several kilometers per second, it's not a trivial task. Now, when you want to use this information in real time to save life or protect infrastructure, that is really a, a big challenge, especially when the rupture is still moving. Now, just to give you a sense of scale and time, uh, in space and in time, if we look at a replay of the 1927 Jericho earthquake, which occurred where the red uh, little cross is, you can see that within 30 kilometers, you have today 5 million people. Now, if we consider that that rupture progresses at about three kilometers per second towards us, the green point, you will see that within eight seconds, the first seismic waves, the P waves, will already reach Amman and Jerusalem. After 13 seconds, do you still hear me when I'm here? Okay. After 13 seconds, the S waves, the second type of waves, already reach, cheers. And after six, oh, sorry. By that time, the rupture is zapping through in front of us, continuing south. And after 16 seconds, while the rupture is still continuing, we already have massing ground motion in Amman and Jerusalem. You've understood time is of the essence. Now, earthquake early warning systems have existed for several years. Actually, they're very successful and they've saved many, many lives in Japan. These systems are based on networks of individual sensors, sometimes very dense like in Japan, sometimes more sparse like in California. Then the data is analyzed, possibly in real time, and they use a very uh, an empirical and quite old relationship established actually in the 50s by Richter to get extract the magnitude, and they do it on some later wa waves, not on the initial waves. And then, to have a sense of what would be the ground motion at specific distance, they use attenuation curves, which you see there. But the attenuation curves are empirical attenuation curves. They're designed and calculated for all various sites. You cannot transfer one to the other one. Now, finally, you have a screen print of the product, of the final product. This is from the system <coughs> being tested now in California. What you can see is that on your screen, on your application, you will have an indication of where the earthquake occurred, the little red star, your house in uh, blue there. And then you have a prediction of how, much, how many seconds, we're talking about seconds, you'll have until the strong ground motion comes and what kind of strong motion you can expect. Now, the first issue is, again, I want to say, we're looking at the first process is locating the source, assessing the, parameter, the source parameter, the magnitude, and then predicting the ground motion. Now, if we look at the issue in a simple way, how it's done in a classic way, we need at least four stations. We need a knowledge of the subsurface velocity, and basically it's a grid search with a minimum and you can see that the ellipses gives you, uh, with, a, with a minimal residual, will give you the location. So that is absolutely robust, easy to do, and it's great. Works wonderful, wonders in Japan. The network is extremely dense. They have very good predictions. Now, what happened when, like it is in most of the world, you can see on the map below, most of the seismicity occurs off land, offshore. So that means that your source is away from your network. And there you can see that the error ellipse grows massively. Now, <coughs> in that case, what we have 
is that we have a linear network, the first four stations that would record the earthquake are linearly dis located, as it is the case along seashores or along political borders, like it is here. And then, not only the error ellipse grows, but here you even have an ambiguity. So you have a huge problem because you don't know where the earthquake is, you have problems locating it, and you're wasting time because you have to wait at least for four, five, six, and more stations. And as we've seen, you don't have time. Now, what I'd like to convince you is that there is a way to do it differently. And actually, we've been playing here in the Dead Sea with mini arrays. And I will show you how we've done it and how we can change it. Basically, uh, this is a spoiler, but we can use two of these mini arrays to locate an earthquake within the array or within a network or off the network. How does it work? Now, you can see an example of one of these mini arrays that we have in, along the Dead Sea. We have several of them. They, basically, what we have is that within about 100 meters, we have several sensors. We collocate velocity and accelerometers. Uh, and they all are connected to one uh, unique uh, digitizer with a fixed timestamp. What happens is that as the transient or any transient will pass through the array, the first thing we can do, we can check out the different traces and just by analyzing the difference in amplitude, we can see whether the source is local or not and we can reject uh, false alerts, which is one of the big problem of uh, earthquake early warning system since they have a single sensor and they're not able to tell if it's somebody that jumps next to the sensor or if it's an earthquake. The next thing we do is that we can we can compute the slowness vector, the vector that you see in blue there, and it gives us the direction of propagation of the wavefront and its speed. Now what we do is that we do we compute the difference in arrival time between the different sensors and we, calcute, we can compute the vector. We can do it with all combinations of triangle and very often we have even more than four sensors. So what we have then is that we have a fan of slowness vectors which point out in the direction of the earthquake and this without knowing what is the velocity model under us. I can just deploy them anywhere in the world and I will know. Now what we do also is that our system is not based on a trigger like standard systems. Uh, what we do is that we monitor the waveforms in continuous mode and in real time. So on the top, you can see, we just put these waveforms together. We have a quality factor that assess the quality of the waveform similarity. And within 0.2 seconds, we can extract the back azimuth, the direction, and the slowness. The slowness is very important to differentiate between seismic events, which are very fast, and acoustic noise, which is much slower. The next thing we can do, and this is also an innovation, we can not only pick the P waves, which is the first one that you see, but we can also pick the S wave. There is actually presently no real-time, efficient real-time picker for S-waves. Now, just with one mini array, we can get two types of information. With a blue line on the P, we can get the slowness vector with, an with, 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 a, with a certain uncertainty. And then we can pick the S, and knowing the <coughs> having a basic idea of the velocity, we can estimate the distance and we can have this little yellow box whose thickness is actually the uncertainty of the phase peaking. So basically, just with one mini array, technically, we can locate the earthquake, not extremely precisely, but enough for an earthquake early warning, especially when we don't have time. I'm going to show you an example of, an, of a small earthquake that happened in the north here. So basically what we have is that the earthquake starts where the red cross is. The wave, the wave front of the P waves hits the first mini array at time zero. 
0.2 seconds later, we already can compute in real time a back azimuth. So we can point already in the direction of the source. As soon as the wavefront hits the second mini array, we can compute an EDT. I don't go into details. And shortly after, we have already the second back azimuth, which, which confirms. And you can see that we have a little box with the location. Just for comparison purpose, if we do a location offline with all the stations of the national network, about 60 stations, this is the ellipse, the error ellipse you get. Uh, so our locations are not that bad after 1.1 second with two mini arrays. Now, the nice thing also, the, the additional benefit of that is that we're monitoring these waveforms in real time continuously. So what it means is that not only we can identify phases, but we can also know that the phases have not yet arrived. And the not yet arrived information is extremely precious. Because in that case, we have a minimal estimation, uh, an estimation of the minimal distance, which we can translate it to, into a minimal magnitude. So while the process is still going on, while at the mini array I'm still waiting for the S waves, I already know that I have at least an earthquake of magnitude so and so. Uh, I think I will skip, skip on this. So this is the second paradigm shift, and it has to do with the ground motion prediction uh, equations. So as I said before, in our field, everything is empiric, empirical. You can see a lot of parameters, lots of attenuation curves. What we've done is that we have developed a model, a model based on the omega square uh, model by Brun from the 70s, and we've derived some equations that relate the source parameters to the far field uh, ground motion. And what we do is that we just, in real time, inject the, the measurements in the time domain that we have on the sensors. And first of all, we can extract the two first blue parameters that you see here, omega naught and the corner frequency F F1. And then we can solve, inject them, and solve for the moment magnitude, a magnitude which is much more accurate than the standard one, the stress drop, I'll tell you in a second why it's important, and an attenuation factor. So I'll go very fast on this just to show you, uh, compare our approach with the other one. On the right side, you see data from California with an approach which is done on, offline because that approach done by colleague is not available in real time. This is our approach and it's done with data from California, Jap Japan, Taiwan and Mexico. I want you to see that the sigma is about similar at the beginning. After one second, we take a uh, uh, growing window of one second, two, three, up to ten. And I want you to see the convergence of the data towards the 1-1 one, one curve. It's a log-log. On, uh, on the x-axis, you have the catalog magnitude and the predictions from the two uh, system. So I'll run fast through it. Okay. What you've seen is that on our data, we really converge towards the 1-1. One, one. The error is minimal, whereas in the other approach, which again cannot be done in, in real time, we still have like an error bar of over one magnitude uh, for uh, <coughs> one order of magnitude for each of them. So the take home message here is that through that approach, which is model based, we take the data in real time, the waveform or the estimation of the RMS in real time, we inject it, we can get an estimation of the peak ground acceleration of velocity. Our approach is generic, it works everywhere. We don't have to calibrate, we don't have to deploy stations anywhere, it's, it works everywhere. And the last thing is that we have an assessment in real time of the stress drop, which is an important source parameter. And as you will see there, the stress drop beyond the magnitude of about four, the influence of the stress drop can be almost one order of magnitude. Okay? So it's a very important parameter for engineers and for prediction damage. The last thing I'll go very fast on it 
it's, it's another change. We, we're not the only ones now, finally, to go into machine learning. But the idea is that can we also even minimize the time? Because most earthquakes, and even in Japan, suffer from blind zone. The blind zone is a zone very near the epicenter within which no timely alert can be delivered. Okay, we're just too close to the source. And we're trying to cut down that. <coughs> and the idea is to use machine learning to try to get one second of data under the mini array and already try to predict it. We just at the beginning of it, but we can already see some extremely nice results uh, using 12 attributes only a few hidden layers, we already uh, lower the residuals by about 25%. Now, uh, all these algorithms have been just patented and we're actually working with a local uh, startup to commercialize it. We've deployed it here in the region and I'd like to show you now a very short movie that shows that very first uh, events that I described before. I want you, it's very fast, so I want you to pay attention to the following thing. Every cone that you see is actually a, a transient that was detected by the mini array, identified and located, so it's pointing towards the source. When it is green, the slowness is acoustic, so it can be a, a boom, it can be a blast, it can be just anything, any kind of anthropogenic noise. When it detects a earth, potential earthquake, the beam will be red, and then you will see they cross each other. The last thing that I'd like you to, to pay attention is that we, you will see the example of a, of a small earthquake, and since we continue monitoring, you will see it continues after the earthquake, we can have a very good control on aftershocks, but should we have an quarry blast at the same time, 20 kilometers away, we can differentiate it. And we would not associate it to another rupture or to a longer rupture. And, and avoid false alert or exa exaggeration in the, in the predictions. So I want you to pay attention. It's very quick. On the top three lines, you see the waveforms as it is and the quality parameters are shown on the, third, on the three lower lines, and as you can see now it's located, but the system keeps working and, and is waiting for more data, and, and again we have a control to know which phase has arrived and which phase has not arrived. So the take-home message is quite simple. We've been able to develop or modify standard earthquake early warning system by making the location much faster and much more robust. The approach being not empirical can be applied anywhere, anytime. And without calibration, most of the systems needs about 10 or 15 years of earthquakes to cali calibrate. And think about an area which is not seismically terribly active, it will need even more time. We just don't need any time. We've shortened or we've eliminated the blind zone and we're limiting the false alerts to the minimum. So the, we're very excited about it, but we thought of another challenge and I think there I, I meet the other people and I was very happy to see that some of my colleagues there are doing science and addressing society problems. Uh, it's great if in California, in Japan, or even in Israel, we have enough money to have these amazing systems, it's brilliant. Now, what happened in the rest of the world? So we're privileged enough to get uh, an Israel Science Foundation grant with Indians. And we are, the next episode is that we are now in the process of deploying here and comparing with India and deploying one in India and using low cost sensors because our approach should allow us to use very low cost sensors, and I'm talking about two orders of magnitude in terms of money. So basically, the accelerometers that you all have in your iPhones, this is the type of instruments we can use, uh, and I hope we'll get some good results about that. So I want to thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry I'm so late. Questions, Tyrell? So I have 
two practical questions. The first is, these things are supposed to stand out there. What is their power source and who maintains their uh, activity all the time and the flowing of, of power? Who's going to take care of it? Is it going to be the government or the private company or, or what? And then the second question is, so we know where the earthquake is. How do we re relay the information to protect the people in the cities? Okay, two things. So the first, the first thing uh, about the infrastructure, uh, it gave me the chance to say that until now, every single early warning system, not that many, but depends on the national seismic network. Now, with that, we can go tomorrow morning in Guatemala, instrument just the region we need, the source region we need, and we're totally independent, okay? In terms of electricity and internet, almost everywhere you have uh, internet, uh, you have, uh, sorry, cellular phones. We don't, although we sample at 500 hertz, which is a lot faster than anybody else, we only transfer in real time the quality factors. So we need very little, we transmit very little information in real time, so we can do it with normal cellular phones. So even in India, I think it could work, but it's sure, we need electricity 24 seven. And that is the only thing. So uh, the saving grace is that most of the, net, of the seismic network, people to have better results always deploy them somewhere lost, where you have no noise, where you have no body, where you have no thieves, where you have, okay? We can deploy anywhere, because with the four, with at least the four mini hour, the four sensors, we can compare the traces. It's a little more work, but we do it in real time, and we can clean the noise, the anthropogenic noise. So we have less problem, and we can deploy them in a university or in a police station, something that, uh, so. And the last question, how do you relay the information to the cities? I mean, everything, if there's an earthquake here... Okay, so, look, uh, we try to do as well as we can in earthquakes and seismology. I'm not a communication expert. Here in the country, we happen, the country is also building their own. In parallel, we're helping them, making it even faster and better. So here, the government is taking care of it. Uh, Yes, it, it, it's, it can be the, the big problem. The, the problem usually is what the decision maker do with the information or want to do if it's available. But it's a great question. Okay, thank you. The boss is telling me there are no further questions. So let me thank the speakers of the session again and all of the sessions.